Testing one, two, testing. Okay, we're good. We will go ahead and get started today. We're going to hear from our uh, second group of presenters this morning. Group B. And I ask all of you as you come to the stage to present uh, to wipe down between um, when you're done. So the next person, they can just come up and everything will be fresh and, and clean. And the keyboard and the area where you will be placing your notes and things, make sure you wipe them off. We can, we can never be too safe. Okay. So let's see who's present in group B. Let's see. Fox. Owen Gates. Dakota Henderson. Tyler Rose. Tyler, get us started. Take the stage. Erica Roland, go second. People are still arriving, so and there's Owen. Can't get everybody in. So I'll just continue taking the roll here. Maybe win. Victoria and Jerry here. Haley Johnson. Caitlin Howard, Sammy Rana, who's in the hall, so most of the names. Dan is here. Sammy. Jacqueline. Brother. Carson, I got your email. Okay. Sarah, Courtney Woodard, and Tamara. All right. Let's give Tyler Rose a round of applause and tell us about the Boston Red Sox. You may begin. Uh, good morning, class. Uh, I did my speech today on the greatest baseball field. And as you can tell by the title of the speech, I'll talk to and look it up for the day. These are some I did as the categories, uh, minor league, major league, and then I called it old school baseball field. These are the uh, three minor league fields that I think are probably the greatest. So we got Jackie Robinson Ballpark. Um, it opened in 1988. The capacity is 16,600 people that it can hold. And it's located in Buffalo, New York. It's named after the infamous baseball player. Everyone probably knows we don't really have to watch baseball. Jackie Robinson, he's the one that broke the color barrier for the baseball. And then the next field we have is MCU Park. They opened in 2001 at the capacity of 7,000 people, and it's located in Brooklyn, New York. And probably one of my favorite things about it, you can tell by the picture out in the background behind the wall, is it has a roller coaster. I don't know about you, but if I was to a baseball game, I might want to go ride the roller coaster too, especially during the seventh inning stretch. And just watch the game come out there. You never know at the peak of the roller coaster. Just look over. Might see someone hit a home run. And this is AutoZone Park. This is the St. Louis Cardinals minor league uh, affiliates, the Memphis Redbirds. Um, it opened in 2000. It has a capacity of 10,000 people. It's located in downtown Memphis, Tennessee. I've personally been there before. Uh, me and my brother and my dad went. Uh, to watch the Memphis Redbirds play the Iowa Cubs, which is the Chicago Cubs minor league affiliate. 
and we actually know the manager of the uh, AA Chicago Cubs minor league and he got us two autographed baseballs after the game. One was by Chris Bryant, the third baseman for the Chicago Cubs right now. The other was for shortstop and second baseman Addison Russell. Now we got the three major league fields. As you can probably guess what the first one might be. Uh, so we got Fenway Park, Boston Red Sox, you know, gonna do stuff out this year, but that's okay. Uh, this is actually the oldest baseball field still standing and being played at. It opened in 1912. That's capacity of 37,731 people that it can hold. There have been more than that, but they kind of got in trouble for it. It's located in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, uh, like I said, it's the home of the Boston Red Sox. And an iconic moment that happened at this field was Ted Williams greatest hitter of all time. Uh, he hit the longest home run in Fenway at the time, which was 502 feet. And at the end of the presentation, I'll get to um, exactly where he hit it. If you look down the right field line where the stands are up there, go to the left behind the bullpens. So it was probably about right in this area. But I'll show you how you can tell when it's empty towards the end. Next is Oracle Park. This is in San Francisco, California, home to the San Francisco Giants. I personally kind of like this field because over the right field wall it goes into the San Francisco Bay. So people hit home runs over the wall into the bay. And during games, people sit out there in their canoes or makeshift boats and rafts, and they'll go after the home run balls and they'll get up on camera too. It has a capacity of 41,950 people that can hold and plus the people that sit out in the canoes behind the right field wall. Um, one of the, an iconic moment is the San Francisco Giants first baseman, J.T. Snow. As he was coming home, he had probably some great awareness to see the manager's son, uh, Darren Baker running to get the bat because he was a bat boy for that game and he pretty much picked them up which avoided a collision from the next runner coming in and I have a video at the end that I will show you guys of this. Next is Wrigley Field. I know you don't have to watch a lot of baseball to know this field. This is one of the, another iconic field. Opened in 1914 has a capacity of 41,649 people. It's located in Chicago, Illinois, and it's home of the Chicago Cubs. And a very iconic moment that's been argued over the like time, but you never really know. I have a clip at the end that I'll show you. Babe Ruth called a shot in a World Series in 1932. Uh, he got, goes up to bat, the dugout's chirping at him, the stands are chirping at him, watches two strikes, gets two balls, and then he's chirping back and points the toe dead center by a flagpole. Very next pitch, just hits it right there. Became one of the most famous things ever in baseball history. Now, we got old school. I'll tell you who these people are. To the left, you got the Boston Red Sox, Ted Williams. In the center, you got the San Francisco Giants, Willie Mays. And on the right, you got the New York Yankees, Babe Ruth. So this field's polo grounds. Uh, if anyone plays video games, there's a game called The Show. I personally like to play at this field. It's easy to hit home runs at. It opened in 1911, has a capacity of 54,555 people, which was the last game ever played there. They over went the capacity and set the record for that place. Located in Guggen Bluff in Upper Manhattan. Um, it was home to the New York Giants baseball team, which became San Francisco Giants, and then and also the New York Yankees. There's a video at the end that of an iconic moment. Willie Mays, amazing catch, running backwards, catches it over the shoulder, turns, throws it in, keeps a run from scoring. And now we have Ebbets Field. It opened in 1913 and was sadly demolished in 1960. Has capacity of 32,000 people located in Brooklyn, New York. Um, 
was home to the Brooklyn Dodgers before they moved out west and became the Los Angeles Dodgers. Um, iconic moment, this is actually the field Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier at by being the first African American to play in the major leagues. And last, the last field I kind of want to talk to you guys today about is Forbes Field. Uh, opened in 1902, once again, got demolished in uh, 1971. Had a capacity of 35,000 people. And it's located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So it was home to the Pittsburgh Pirates, their third home field that they had back in the day. Um, the iconic moment is Babe Ruth's last home run. It was his 714th and on May 25th, 1935. It was a towering shot that cleared the uh, right field stand. As you, yeah, you can see in the picture, it cleared that. Not only did he hit it over there, he had three home runs that game, and then also a double. And on one of his home runs, he cleared that. And I don't know about you, that's a pretty high ball. And so going back to Ted Williams' home run at Fenway Park, that red chair is where he hit the ball. So they wanted to make it noticeable to see where he hit the longest home run. So out of all the green chairs there, they put one red. And the number on it, I believe, is his number. And then the uh, Yankee Snow for the San Francisco Giants, where he faked the kid. This is the clip for that. Live and on demand TV. Now with Google News Famous. YouTube TV. Try it free. 2 1. Brett. Deep right field. Sandman back. At the wall. It's at the wall. Two runs are going to score. Lock the Knicks for third. He's held there. And it's a six run Giants lead. As he saw, he came running in the home and saw the kid. So he made sure he touched home and picked up the kid. And when I was watching this video, you could have saw the catcher if you were probably paying close enough attention. Even the catcher was kind of like trying to get him out of the way with a combined effort. Um, and right here, we have Bruce called home run, Babe Ruth. Um, like I said, it, oh, shoot, did I click it? No, okay, there we go. And, uh, very skeptical people say he wasn't calling his point towards the dugout but on this video i found you hear him talking about it himself before he established afterwards doing everything to get each other well i have this one particular time when i went to bat yelling from the cold dugout was positively a surface as well as from the fans they were, they were in on this. This was a Chicago crowd, and they were throwing things and yelling. And Ruth was standing in the batter's box, yelling back at them between pitches. And our first pitch ball was a call strike. Well, I thought it was outside and didn't like it very much. More yelling back and forth. Strike two. More yelling. Well, I didn't like that when I saw it. Go well, I stepped out of the box, and by that time, they were over there going crazy. The volume coming from the stands was so loud that some of the Cub players were running out of the dugout and cupping their hands with their mouths to make sure he heard them. And then he makes his famous gesture. I don't doubt it, Senator. I feel like trying. I said, I'm going to hit the next pitch ball right past the flagpole. Well, good Lord, it was the difference. Well, it was a
Alexander Vick works up and left hander John Miller ready to go. Here's the pitch to Woods. There's a long drive to deep deep center field base back to the wall. It's an incredible pitch. Tons of fires in. What a catch by Little Ray. So as you saw the catch, that's actually a really hard catch to do on the run backwards, catching it over your shoulder. And he still managed able to plant, stand it, and throw the ball in. And with doing so, he kept the runner, as you saw, from taking off the second if you missed that ball and scoring a run for the opposing team. And right here, we have a video. It's really just talking about how Ruth hit that power, hit three home runs and the towering one over the right field stand. Couldn't find the video of it actually happening. Your decision matters to them. David Perdue is a brighter future, a stronger economy, more money for your family, and you control their health. On May 25, 1935, at Forbes Field, Babe Ruth records just the second three home run game of his career. Ironically, they were the last three home runs of his brilliant career. Ruth, wrapping up his playing days with the Boston Braves, adds a double to his three long balls in an 11-7 loss to the Pittsburgh Pirates. Ruth's 714th home run was hit clear out of Forbes Field. This was the first ball hit out of Forbes Field in the ballpark's history. Ruth will retire just eight days later, and his career total of 714 home runs will stand as the all-time major league record until it's surpassed by Hank Aaron in 1970. So that video is just really telling you pretty much what I told you, that those were his three home run games with the double, and he hit like a missile, it had to be off the bat over the right field wall. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you guys for listening. If you have any questions, you can ask me later. Uh, again, thank you guys.
survey this class. So who in here already knows CPR? Great, great. Okay, so we do have some new people in that. All right, well, that's really great. Um, I'm Erica, and I came from a first responder family. My dad was a fireman, he was a paramedic, and he later became a trauma nurse on a helicopter. My mother was also an EMT and a first responder. So when I was young, it just was a natural progression that once we were of age to start babysitting, we would learn CPR on first date. Because a lot of times we would babysit in very rural areas, and it might take a long time for help to arrive. So it was an important aspect of growing up for us. Um, CPR saves lives. Statistics show that the earlier CPR is initiated, the greater the chances of survival. In fact, the American Heart Association estimates that between 100 and 200,000 adults and children could be saved each year if CPR had been performed early enough. Uh, CPR is cardiopulmonary resuscitation. It's an emergency life-saving procedure performed when the heart stops beating. Immediate CPR can double or triple chances of survival after a cardiac arrest. My goal today is to provide you with just a basic understanding of when to initiate CPR and the five steps to respond to a cardiac arrest. Step one, when you come in, is you definitely want to survey your scene and make sure it's safe for you to go in there and start CPR if it's needed. Make sure that your victim is not lying in water, that there's not a dangerous hazard around for you that might cause you trouble. <clears throat> Is it safe for you to enter the zone? And then once you see your person that's down, can everybody hear me back there? You want to go over and you want to tell them, hey, are you okay? Are you okay? And if they're not responding, you want to pull out your phone, dial 911, put it on speaker, and keep your 911 operator there. If you have somebody else around, you want to point directly at them. You, call 911. You, get an AED. Make sure you take control of what's going on. Don't be apathetic and stand in the back. Direct people if there's somebody there. Otherwise, keep them on 911 while you <clears throat> assess your victim. <clears throat> Once you've got somebody on, you want to check your patient out, you want to see, look and see if their chest is rising because that's going to let us know if there's air getting in. You can get close enough to listen or feel breath if you're comfortable with that. If you do not see any breath sounds, that's when you want to start your CPR. The most important aspect is going to be your compressions. Compressions are the C in CPR. <clears throat> It's as easy as calling a cat. The C is your compressions. Why? Because you want to press on that heart to allow the blood to start flowing back to the heart and the brain. The longer the person goes without their blood circulating, the more chances they have of having some sort of a brain damage. <clears throat> compressions are given, you want to give 30 compressions at a rate of 100 to 120 per minute. That's a lot. And it's a lot of work as well. You want to try to press at least two inches of depth at the sternum, which is right between the breast. You'll kind of feel that little triangle area. You want to press down about two inches and allow for the chest to rise up again. I don't know if you'll be able to see this too well, but you will have removed the clothing from the front, rip it open, pull it up, whatever it takes. Make sure there's not any necklaces or anything in the way of you. You want to get a nice firm palm right here, right over the chest in that sternum area, and press down about that deep. Now you're going to count out loud to 30. And once you've completed 30, then you're going to open your airway, which is simply tilting the chin back and putting the head here. I've got one of these, I'm going to let somebody try it a little bit if they want to. If you have this available, a mask. You're going to put it over the nose, tilt that chin back, and give two breaths, and watch for the chest to rise. And that's not going to take you more than five to eight seconds. And then we're going to go back to our compressions. And how many are we going to give? 30. 30. How deep? Two inches. 
And about what rate? Perfect, awesome. And we're just going to continue those steps until help arrives. So I was hoping I could get a volunteer to come up and give it a try. So because of COVID, we can't even if I wipe them off and stay over here. Why don't you just and then I'll do it. Huh? Why don't you just you go ahead okay. and do it? All right. Yeah. So what we're going to do? Think of the on the ground. And this might come in your AED. And this is a one-way valve. So it will not allow anything that I have to go into my victim or anything that they have to come back onto me. <clears throat> okay, so I have come up and I've tapped and shot. Hey, are you okay? Are you okay? He's not responding and I don't see any breaths. I'm going to pull out my phone and call 911, and I've got my operator on there. I'm going to give them as much information as I have, and then I'm going to count out loud to 30 and give my compression. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Take my mask, open the airway, give them two breaths, watching for the chest to rise, no more than five to eight seconds, and come back and give compressions again. How many compressions? Very How many breaths? Yeah. Very good. <clears throat> Somebody had asked about the Good Samaritan law. If, um, if I'm working at the hospital or at a client's home, I'm obligated to perform CPR or any life-saving first aid that's necessary. If I'm not on call and I'm at the mall and somebody falls down, I don't have an obligation, but I should make a good choice to assist that person if I can. If you're not certified and you know the basics and somebody passes out and you need to help them, their heart stops beating, it's up to you if you want to give it a try. According to the Good Samaritan Law in our area, you would not be held civilly liable if something bad happened because of your efforts. But you should always check and be comfortable with the laws in your area. Because it is not uncommon that you might break a rib, but it's better that you break a rib and that person survives than for you to walk away. That makes sense? And those are easy to find. You can look them up online, the Good Samaritan Malls, because they are a little different in different areas. Does anyone have any questions about that so far? Okay. Um, I also have been teaching CPR, BLS, um, first aid, and AED for about five years at the American Heart Association. So if you'd like to get certified, I'd be glad to help you get that done. If you just like to learn the basics of CPR, I also do classes that way as well. During COVID, we are having all of our classes online where it's a video and you answer questions along the way. And then you would meet with me individually one-on-one -on -one in a safe environment, maybe at the library or it could be here on campus somewhere. And we do wipe down and breaths are completely optional, but we do have fresh ones for everyone and they're always wrapped up. And we do wipe them down clean in between. Um, we also teach for camp counselors, or if you have a hiking group that's getting together, uh, churches, if you have a family member that's maybe sick, sickly and you would like to just know a little bit more about CPR, we also teach that as well. Anybody have any questions? Another good presentation. Uh, so I'll go back to the top of the list now on group B, gun response. So, yeah. Thank you, Mom. I'm, I'm here. I show up to the late. Uh, okay. you can go, yeah. And you can go. I can go. I can go a little Okay. Great.
morning. My name is Dominic Fox, and how many of you like listening to music? Okay, cool. So do I. Um, one of my favorite things to do whenever I listen to music, however, is listening to an album front to back, uh, particularly concept albums. Now, I know that that may not be familiar to everyone, so I'm going to start with what is a concept album exactly? Well, uh, according to Wikipedia's definition, it says a uh, concept album is an album whose tracks have a larger purpose or meaning collectively than they do individually. So this is typically achieved through a single central narrative or theme, which can be instrumental, compositional, or real. The major part of that is the two different kinds of concept albums. You have narrative-based and you have theme-based. And I hope you understand exactly what that means. I have examples. So as for the narrative example, Trench by Tony and Bias. Um, <clears throat> basically, the story of this album, as it is a narrative uh, album, is uh, primarily about the characters Clancy, Tyler Joseph, a main character, which could just be Tyler Joseph, but we're not exactly sure, and a uh, man named Nicholas Borbaki and the rest of the night. Um, the entire story is primarily set within the fictional city of Dima, and it, it is also directly linked to the band's previous album, Blurry, which is also a concept album. Uh, the story itself is a metaphor for mental illness, uh, Dima primarily being an example of uh, depression. Um, Clancy, we're not entirely sure who his character is, but he's the one that's primarily talked directly to the audience and told them the story through notes and letters and everything uh, leading up to the album's release. And the story itself is about Tyler Joseph's character and his attempt to get out of the uh, Nicholas Borbaki and the rest of the Niners are a uh, representation of these things that tend to keep you in this depressive state. And so for the entire uh, story, he's trying his best to get out, but Nicholas Borbaki especially is keeping him in Dima. Uh, there's also the Gambitos, which is another faction that is trying to get him get out. They're supposed to represent kind of the people that are around us trying to help us get out of that depression, but ultimately they can only help. At the end of the day, we ourselves have to climb out of that depression. Uh, now you may have heard me say that we don't exactly know some things, and it's because the story is actually still developing as more music videos come out uh, for the songs that do contribute to the narrative. Uh, right now, the only ones that have music videos are Jumpsuit, uh, Levitate, and Nico the Niners. Uh, <clears throat> and unfortunately, because of COVID, that's probably pushed back the production of these music videos very far. Um, but as more music videos come in, we learn more about the story. And also, it's important to note that when it comes to narrative concept albums, especially, not every song actually has to contribute to the narrative. Uh, some can just be there to have more songs in there, such as songs like Mom's Love in this album, which don't actually have anything to do with the story, but still fit into the album uh, in terms of sound. Uh, that they can kind of just add a break from the narrative so that you don't have to be constantly paying attention the entire time because it makes access sort of a break. Now, as far as the theme example, you have a much weirder album called The Mollusk by Wayne. Now, since it's a theme-based uh, album, there's not quite as much to talk about because really all there is is that the theme is the ocean. Uh, every song contributes to the theme. That's generally how theme-based albums are, because if the song doesn't contribute to the theme, then the album ultimately just becomes very messy and unfocused. So every song on the album plays into this general feeling that just says at sea, whether it be about songs like Ocean Man, which you may recognize from the SpongeBob movie from the original animated one, or other songs that kind of just sound almost like sea shanties that you would hear sailors sing. <coughs> uh, there are sometimes examples of folk, however, such as the Black Parade by Anthony Romance. 
because it can be interpreted as both forms, it has two different meanings that kind of go hand in hand. If you interpret it as the narrative kind of comes with Ali, then it tells two separate stories of two different men and their deaths. Uh, the first <clears throat> the first one story begins at the beginning of the album with the song called The End, and it ends with Welcome to the Black Parade in the middle of the album. Uh, as for the second, it begins with I Don't Love You, which uh, comes right after Welcome to the Black Parade, and it carries through to the end of the album. Um, however, if you look at it from a theme perspective, like I do, uh, the theme is unsurprisingly just death in general. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, every song, because it's a theme, carries into this. However, not every song is exactly literal in its depiction of death. Some of them are more metaphorical, such as I Don't Love You, which is more about the death of love between two people, or a song towards the end of the album called This Enchantment, which is more about an artist's death of passion for creating art. So what exactly makes an album not a concept album? Well, <clears throat> the major difference is content. Uh, regular albums are usually one of two styles. That being either a collection of songs with no real rhyme or reason. Uh, these are usually just greatest hits albums. They're not quite as popular anymore. But you used to see these all the time, especially with older bands and older artists. <clears throat> uh, usually nowadays, you have a collection of songs that go together and sound to form a cohesive listening experience. So basically, placement still matters, but it's not driven by the music. So you still have a song that has to work as an opening to the album, a song that works as an ending, and all the songs in between that have to fit between those two. Uh, some good examples of this are Where Do You All Fall Asleep, Where Do You Go by Billy Irish, Is This Hit by The Slopes, uh, Paramore's subtitle album, or Teleportation by Red Hot Chili Peppers. Now, as for some albums, uh, concept albums that you might actually recognize, uh, you have Pink Floyd with, uh, with The Dark Side of the Moon, which is actually the highest grossing concept album. Uh, the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band which isn't actually the first uh, concept album, but a lot of people think that it is. Rather, it's the one that kind of popularized the idea of having concept albums. The first concept album is actually an album called Freak Out by the Mothers of Invention. Uh, and then you have other ones like Beyonce's Lemonade, Billy Joel's and Innocent Man, uh, Blink-182's self-titled album, uh, Britney Jean by Britney Spears, Childish Things You Know Because of the Internet, uh, Daft Punk's Fullwork, Eagles, Hotel California, Elton John's Captain Fantastic, and The Brown Dirt Cowboy, which is my favorite name out of all of his albums. Never listened to it, but I want to just because of the name. Uh, Channel Orange by Frank Ocean, uh, Gorilla's Game Day, which, fun fact about Gorilla, they're actually a step up from a concept album, and there's something called a concept band where the band itself has a narrative that carries over into each album. Uh, not every album by the world is a concept album, but each one has a story that contributes to the overall narrative of the band. Uh, and then you have Queen's Queen 2 and Tyler the Creator's Eagle. So finally, in conclusion, <coughs> listening to music is generally treated as more of a passive hobby and Listening to concept albums allows the listening to become more passive. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with listening to music passively. I do it all the time, just when I'm walking to class or walking up to my dorm. I'm listening to music just uh, for fun. But uh, there really is no experience quite like listening to a concept album and becoming aware fully of what it's trying to do, whether the narrative or the theme seems to like each song connects or what it connects. So, thank you for listening. Okay, let's make time. I will not be able to give the next event at the fall, two minutes, and two minutes.
And so we will see you on Friday from Old Gate to Cohen Henderson. And then on that day, I'll sit down to see. And please, Carson, you want to go first on Friday and then, then on again Okay? All right. Let's give it to them in one more round. Stay safe, everyone. Have a good day.